Hello, and welcome back to the Mayo Clinic Medscape video series. I am Alfredo Clavel, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Mayo Clinic and Medical Director of our Heart Transplant Program. Today, we will be discussing medications to improve heart transplant outcomes, serolimus and beyond. I am joined by my colleague, Dr. Sudhir Kushwaha, Professor of Medicine and an expert in this area. Welcome, Dr. Kushwaha. Good morning, Alfredo, and it's uh, good to be here. And we can have a good conversation about this. This is, this is great. I know we've talked about this in our yeah. clinical practice often with the whole group, but I, today I want the audience to hear a little bit about the, why are we using serolimus and what are the advantages and perhaps disadvantages, etc. So we'll start with uh, what is the history of serolimus uh, use, use in the uh, Mayo Heart Transplant Program? Well, there's an interesting history. I mean, sirolimus, otherwise known as rapamycin, has been known for many years to be a powerful immunosuppressive antiproliferative drug. And so first it was thought to be an antibiotic, but then its uh, immunosuppressive properties became apparent. It's a fungal derivative. It was discovered on the island of Rapa Nui, Easter Island, and initially was known as rapamycin. And then when it became commercialized, it became uh, known as sirolimus. Now, because of the basic science data, which has been there for many years, and the known effects on certain pathways which cause suppression of T cells, years ago, back in the early 2000s, um, I thought that it would be a good and interesting perspective to look at whether or not we could use these advantages, these known antiproliferative immunosuppressive advantages, uh, in our program. And the reason is because heart transplant outcomes are really affected by a number of factors, one of which, most important of which probably, is cardiac allograft vasculopathy, which is otherwise known as transplant-related coronary disease, which is known to be a highly proliferative process. So we started initially with a pilot study back in 2003, just looking at 12 patients, in whom we looked at renal function predominantly, because renal function is also um, a problem post-heart transplantation because of the immunosuppressive drugs we use. Um, tacrolimus and cyclosporin, which we were mostly using in, the, in that era, suppress um, or cause degradation of renal function over time. So the first, this pilot study we had of just 12 patients was really aimed at looking at renal function. It's a one-year study and we demonstrated that renal function improved in a group of patients in whom we targeted for sirolimus use. So that's how it started. And then when we um, developed experience with the drug and we realized that patients were actually doing quite well on it and they weren't developing rejection, we extended the study to look at the most important uh, long-term um, determinant of survival, which is the transplant-related coronary disease. And we subsequently went on and started putting more and more patients on it and had a number of publications to, uh, which demonstrated that um, a patient outcome, and in particular, um, allograft vasculopathy, was suppressed by the use of this drug. And you've covered, I think, already some of the advantages or disadvantages of the standard immunosuppression versus the new kid on the block. We've had 20 years worth of experience with sarolimus, and would you care to comment in terms of how many patients in our programs are managed with the sarolimus uh, at this well, uh, percentage-wise? I mean, is this well tolerated? Are there side effects? Are there yeah, concerns? I mean, the reality is, Alfredo, that all the drugs we use are toxic agents. Um, we're dealing with immunosuppression to suppress rejection of the transplanted heart, the consequences of which would be catastrophic. And so standard immunosuppression presently consists of tacrolimus, mycophenolate, and steroids. And all of those drugs have side effects in themselves. Sirolimus is no exception. It has a unique set of side effects, which are different from tacrolimus, but they're still uh, somewhat unpleasant side effects as well. But it's a case of um, which poison do you pick, and, which, and therefore, which side effects do you pick? So, Whereas tacrolimus can cause hypertension, headaches, tremors, uh, 
um, a variety of other um, side effects. Sirolimus, on the other hand, causes mouth ulcers, uh, sometimes peripheral edema, GI side effects. But the, the way we get through all this is that usually the patients get used to the side effects to a certain extent and actually over time they tend to diminish. In our program, I would say right now we have about 60% of our patients who are primarily immunosuppressed with sirolimus rather than tacrolimus, in addition to the other two agents which I mentioned earlier. Correct. And we have found the experience with uh, this particular agent to be quite gratifying in a number of personal cases. Yeah. Um, one thing that I think we like to point out, right, is, is that is something we start later in the process because it also has wound healing. Uh, Correct, and that's, effects, that's, a, um, that's a very important point. The, the very anti-proliferative properties we take advantage of in suppressing um, allograft vasculopathy and then also cancer, which we'll discuss a little bit later, is also a downside of the drug because it impairs wound healing because for wound healing we need proliferation to occur. And so a drug which suppresses proliferation is also going to suppress wound healing. So we don't start it de novo up front immediately after transplant. We tend to wait until everything is healed up, typically six months, but in some patients who might require intervention earlier, we might go to three to four months. Well, let's delve into the most important thing that we want a rejection drug to do, which is prevent rejection. So are rejection rates any different with Lymus? I mean, have we observed any significant difference between tacrolimus, cyclosporin, or sarolimus? Well, the, the short answer is no. The historical perspective is that when we first started using sarolimus, we were, we were very worried that people were going to come in with severe rejection. In that initial pilot study, there was no difference, uh, but that was only a very small series. And then subsequently in our larger studies, when we looked at rejection rates, uh, treatable rejection rates, there's really no difference. Now, the reality is any patient can reject, doesn't matter what immunosuppressives they're on. And we have a surveillance program looking for that specifically. But we've looked at this at least four times over the last several years since we started our program, and we haven't found any uh, difference in rejection rates. And that is gratifying because uh, it would be a major disadvantage if patients were coming in with treatable, with uh, catastrophic rejection, which could uh, you know, result in a poor outcome. And obviously we don't want that. We want um, a really good outcome for our patients. Now, of course, you know, a lot of that has to do with the uh, fine tuning of the program on how do we transition for cyclosporin, uh, tacrolimus, which is mostly what we use to sarolimus, and that gap and overlap uh, for several weeks on both drugs as we get one down and put the one other to prevent precisely the rejection. So that's really the most important thing. But, yeah. but, uh, but talking about the side, now we're talking about changing the side effect profile. And I mean, I think the audience is well aware that sarolimus is commonly used for coating stents more recently than more recent stents are covered with everolimus to prevent the proliferation from stents. Uh, and so let's delve into the transplant vasculopathy. How has that affected um, our transplant vasculopathy rates as we transition more and more patients to serolimus? Well, we have, um, I think, demonstrated in the published literature um, that our allograft vasculopathy rates clearly come down. There's no doubt. I mean, the data is overwhelming and very strong. And in addition, we've demonstrated um, over a lengthy period of time, 12 to 15 years now, that overall survival from all cause mortality improves as well. So the, the, the suppression of the vasculopathy results in improvement in long-term survival. So if we look at the ISHLT database, which really covers all the data worldwide in all transplant patients, and look back at the survival curves, which understandably includes some historical data, we see that the 10-year survival, on average, if we take the history of heart transplantation, is about 60%. Now, if we look at individual programs, uh, we see that that rate is maybe more like 65 to 70 10-year survival. So it's not very gratifying if you're a patient who's 25 
and your doctor says, well, actually, or the patient themselves looks up these days before they come into the doctor's office, and that's a far more common scenario. They look up and they say, well, you know, there's a 60% chance that I might be dead in 10 years after heart transplant. If you're 25 years old, that's not really very good news. And so what I think we will find as we extend out another decade or two that we will see more and more long-term survivors. And there are a handful of patients in our program, admittedly anecdotal, so we can't really project uh, their data to a broader cohort, but um, there are a handful of patients who we converted early on because they had vasculopathy and we expected them not to do well and they weren't retransplant candidates but those patients have actually continued on a decade later with angiograms which really haven't shown a huge amount of progression in disease. Yeah, and it's a the big emphasis I think you pointed out but for the benefit of the audience is, is that the sooner you start the, the serolimus, the transition, the better the outcomes. Uh, of course, when we started doing this, we were putting patients on that had been already several years on that, but we found always that the sooner you start the medication, because I think a lot of programs wait till they're having a problem to consider transitioning, and although that strategy may be helpful for that particular patient, a strategy of transitioning most of everybody early on is probably a better strategy. And that's absolutely right, Alfredo. It's a very valid point. And in fact, that's one of the main points we made in our publication, which looked at a long-term cohort, that the earlier the conversion, the greater the degree of allograft vasculopathy suppression. So we have benefits in the disappointing rate of renal dysfunction that we invariably see with the calcineurin inhibitors, that's tacrolimus and cyclosporine. We have seen benefits in allograft vasculopathy that translate into better survival because transplant allograft vasculopathy is a major cause of morbidity and mortality as we get into the five, 10 years. But lastly, there's an unexpected finding that you published a landmark paper here recently in terms of malignancy rates in the long term following um, sero the serolimus conver converted patients. And how is that affected? Because we know that malignancy is also another major source of morbidity and mortality in transplant patients. Correct, and, and that's a, a very good point. I mean, malignancy, um, vasculopathy are the two major causes of mortality. And the reason transplant patients are prone to malignancy is because the immune system, which we need uh, to prevent infection, also, under normal circumstances, um, deals with uh, cancer cells aberrant cancer cells which our bodies are producing all the time. And so we're, and we're suppressing that immune system. So what we've seen across the board uh, with all transplants, with all solid organ transplants, is that if you suppress the immune system, you're gonna have an increased rate of cancer. And there are two types of cancer. We, one common type is a variation of a B-cell lymphoma. We call that PTLD or post-transplant lymphomatous disease. And we're constantly looking for that when we um, undertake surveillance on our patients. And then there are non-PTLD cancers as well. So the rates of both are increased in heart transplant recipients. And because the level of immunosuppression tends to be high in our population compared to perhaps other organs which le need less immunosuppression, our cancer rates are relatively high as well when we compare with the broad cohort of um, transplant recipients overall. And so cancer is a proliferative process. So in other words, it requires for a cancer to grow and become manifest, it requires cells to be proliferating at a rapid rate, a high turnover of cells. And it's very characteristic with PTLD. So you'll have a, a, a a small collection of cells which will rapidly get bigger and then manifest in the patient. And so the initial studies using rapamycin in the lab showed that it suppresses these cells. And so we looked at this and we looked at rates of PTLD in our traditional immunosuppression patients compared with the sirolimus treated patients. And sure enough, there is a significant difference in cancer suppression. And that translated not only into PTLD, but also into uh, non 
PTLD and also other types of skin cancers and variety of other cancers actually. And so I think that's another reason why patients um, that all cause mortality is better as well. So it's the vasculopathy and cancer suppression. So I think that it um, really makes a lot of sense to be using this approach to immunosuppression in heart transplant recipients. Yeah, and I think it was originally sort of an idea born from the fact that we had a new, medic a new medication that, that was likely to be effective, but now we've had 20 years of experience and a number of publications clearly documenting that serolimus is a superior drug. If a patient can tolerate it, and we talked a little bit about the side effects, but most of our patients can with a careful uh, transition, and I, I think it's just great to, to discuss and enlighten everybody else about our experience with serolimus, which granted is probably the largest um, cohort of serolimus treated patients in the, in the heart transplant population. Thank you, Sudhir, uh, for these very important insights, and thank you for joining us on the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. Thank you.